can see what's happening and how it affects them and that they can weigh in. our country better. It's the dawn of a new era in Washington, D.C. this morning. Thank you for tuning in on this special edition of Daily Dose. Here is the situation President Trump is waking up to this morning. For the first time in his political career, the Republicans do not control both houses of Congress. For a midterm race, the turnout was simply astronomical. It's projected to be more than 100 million Americans who cast a ballot that is a midterm record. And Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi now once again eyeing the speaker role, one of the most powerful positions in government. She was House Speaker before from 2007 to 2011, the only woman to have that position. Here's what Pelosi had to say about the future a few hours ago. Today is more than about Democrats and Republicans. It's about restoring the Constitution's checks and balances to the Trump administration. In stark contrast to the GOP Congress, a Democratic Congress will be led with transparency and openness so that the public can see what's happening and how it affects them and that they can weigh in with the members of Congress and with the President of the United States. A lot of races, in fact, are still too close to call. Votes still being counted right now. A lot to unpack. With me in studio, I have Nadav Tamir, the International Affairs Director with Perez & Associates, also a former Consul General of Israel in Boston and Greater New England. Also, our Owen Alterman, Senior International Affairs Correspondent. And joining us live from D.C. this morning is our Senior Diplomatic Correspondent, Nina Larson. Nina, let me start with you. President Trump up early this morning, already tweeting, saying that he will hold a press conference in the next three, three and a half hours. What's Trump thinking this morning, do you think? Well, Jeff, he really has to recalculate now. It wasn't quite the blue tsunami that the Democrats were exactly hoping for. Uh, but the equation has completely changed here in Washington, uh, with the Democrats now in a firm majority in the House. This is going to cause President Trump an awful lot of problems in any kind of legislation that he wants to put through. He's also going to be open now to an absolute barrage of investigations. Uh, let's not forget that this puts the Democrats firmly in charge of all those very powerful congressional committees, the Ways and Means, the Judicial, Homeland Security. That's going to be tackling uh, the immigration issue, for instance. And we have that uh, the shadow of the Mueller inquiry that's bound to be uh, some kind of report coming out quite soon. So a lot of drama to come here in Washington. All right, let me turn also here in studio, Owen, the results, some could say not as bad as uh, feared, as predicted. Yes, the Democrats gained control of the House. That was projected for months. That's actually rather normal for a party to take back control at the midterms. But the Republicans, they extended their lead in the Senate. They did better than expected. Trump, when he personally campaigned for someone, that person did very well. Uh, he's did well in battleground states. It's not a bad picture at all for the Republicans. Am I wrong in putting that out there? Not a terrible picture for Republicans, Jeff. And by the way, a great picture for pollsters. A great night for pollsters last night. The polls and the models did a great job in predicting the results. 
very much like what those results looked like according to those polls and those models in the closing days of the election campaign. But look, you're absolutely right. As expected, the Republicans not only kept the Senate, but actually extended their majority in the Senate meaningfully, by the way. Don't forget, the Senate is the only chamber of Congress that deals with nominations and confirmations, most importantly of judges, as we just saw in the Brett Kavanaugh hearings and confirmation, but also ambassadorships, members of the cabinet. So that extra margin of error for Donald Trump could be very, very important. And as for the House, you're right, in the, in the midterm elections, the party that does not hold the White House usually gains ground. So it came to pass in 2018, a norm of American politics that was not broken in the Trump era. So Donald Trump can, as he appears to already be doing on Twitter, paint this as something of a victory. That said, exactly as Nina just told us, this could create real headaches for the Trump administration, again, with the subpoena power for those House chairmen. On the other hand, if the Democratic House has the subpoena power, Donald Trump still has the Twitter power, and I suspect that he will do to those House committee chairmen what he has done to the media, give them all sorts of nicknames. And attack just as he, them personally, go attack online. Attack them personally, just as he called the media fake news. He'll take on very, very directly the institution sure. of the House of Representatives. Uh, Nadav, exit polls clearly show that there were two main issues that were important to voters this election. It was health care, by far the number one issue for voters, but also immigration. Immigration concerns, concerns about this migrant caravan. That was on the top of mind for many voters in many key, key districts and swing states. These two issues, what do they indicate to you moving forward with the American politics and political situation? First of all, I want to, uh, to say something about uh, the question to my colleague here. I think pollsters definitely should celebrate because they recovered after the disaster of 2016, but also Democrats can celebrate. They can celebrate because um, actually the playing field is tilted against them in so many ways. Uh, you know, I, I think around 7 million more people voted for Democrats for Senate and still the Republicans won some seats. But the trend is very good for the Democrats. You see that Texas is almost flipping colors. And I think 2020 will be the first year where Democrat candidates actually is, are going to campaign in Texas. You see that in Florida, the proposal to get uh, former prisoners to vote could actually uh, affect uh, a swing state like Florida. Yeah, say hundreds exactly. of thousands of extra voters, perhaps, to the rolls. Nina, what about those issues? Immigration and health care appear to be the two biggest issues for voters. Does that help Trump, help the Republicans, or hurt them? Well, uh, as we see, the, the Senate has uh, really held firm uh, for the Republican side. But, you know, this is an issue that, uh, as far as the House is concerned, people are very, very galvanized about. You saw all those unexpected victories in states like Texas. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of Latino women that have come to the fore now. This was a very, very dramatic uh, overnight uh, for women candidates. If I might say, there was an unprecedented number of women that have uh, forged a path now. And this is something that's very, very important. Uh, uh, they're going to be looking at those family se separations down at the border, the Dreamers Act, all of that kind of thing. These are very emotive issues that are going to uh, find themselves in absolute gridlock in uh, a Democratic-controlled Congress. As I said, there's a lot of work for the Trump administration to do. They're going to have a lot of support in the Senate, ultimately. Uh, but uh, as far as the House is concerned, uh, there's going to be a lot of barricades now for the Trump administration, and particularly with those kind of, of policies. Uh, the border wall, for example, uh, that, that won't muster through the Budget Committee, and it'll have to get through Homeland Security. They'll have to also look at the travel ban, for instance. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of committee will have to justify that. And yeah, lot, all of these issues are going to be under scrutiny. A lot certainly will be changing on Capitol Hill. More after a short break still to come. We'll continue with our up-to-the-minute analysis of the midterm election. Several races still too close to call. More reporting coming up. Live images right now in Washington, D.C. The sun rising on a clear, crystal blue morning over the U.S. Capitol. But it is a different era in Washington for the first time in his political career. President Trump does not have control of both houses of Congress. And for the first time ever, Muslim women have been elected to serve in the U.S. Congress. Michigan's Rashida Talib and Minnesota's Ilhan Omar are both 
progressive Democrats that both won their races to leave previously served as a representative in the Michigan State House. She's the daughter of Palestinian immigrants, and when she won, her family and supporters draped her in the Palestinian flag. Omar served in the Minnesota State House. She's a former refugee who arrived in America as a refugee as a young girl after escaping the Somalia Civil War. Over in New York, 29-year-old Democratic Socialist Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez won. She is now the youngest woman ever elected to Congress. Also, just 29 years old, just a few months older, still 29, though, Abby Finkenauer won her race in Iowa. Here now is first-time woman candidate and winner Jennifer Wexton about why so many women have been choosing to run. But we have the power to make things better. And as President Obama said yesterday... <laughs> is important. Better helps people. Let's make our country better. On the state level, Democrat Jared Paulus won his race for governor of Colorado. He is now the first openly gay governor in U.S. history. He has two kids with his longtime partner, history made in Colorado. Now, a quarter of voters said that immigration was the biggest issue on their minds for the election. President Trump has pushed the immigration issue at every campaign rally and speech for weeks now. Right now, there are more than 5,000 active duty troops along the U.S.-Mexico border. But just days ago, Trump said he is ready to triple that number by the end of the month, sending 15,000 personnel, military personnel, to guard against that caravan of roughly 3,000 migrants walking to the border. 5,000 troops, already a massive number. If the deployment does reach in the next few weeks, 15,000, it would be equivalent to the size of the U.S.'s military presence in all of Afghanistan. Trump says that the Central American caravan is an invasion, and he would authorize whatever it takes to keep them from infiltrating America. Several Democrats also in key battleground states support Trump's plan when it comes to the border. Back in studio now, I want to, Nadav, this is a big issue for President Trump, immigration, the invasion. Trump calls himself a nationalist. Is this a winning policy for him? The voters seem to resonate with that concern about these migrants, about the immigration in general. Well, all Americans are immigrants. I mean, I, I, don't, think, um, I, I don't think that most Americans buy that, that it's a real threat for America, because each one of them came from some immigration family. You can see, actually, the Jewish vote, 79 percent voted for Democrats because they feel that they were immigrants themselves. So I think it is working for a short term uh, because of all this, you know, media attention to it, but it's not a real threat on America, and I think most Americans will not buy it at, at the end of the day. Uh, Nina, I want to turn to you about the number of women who are running for office. The glass ceiling simply shattered. 28 first-time candidates are now waking up as U.S. Congresswomen elect. More than 100 women now are going to be serving in the U.S. Congress, dozens of them first-time candidates. Why are so many women running, and why are so many of them winning as Democrats? Perhaps what does it say about the future of the American political system? Well, it could be quite possibly that uh, President Trump hasn't antagonized so many women, Jeff. Uh, the kind of rhetoric he's been using, the kind of language we've heard about women, and, of course, uh, that... Uh, added to the Me Too movement over the past couple of years has really made a lot of women a lot more politically active here. A lot of women, if they're not running for office, they've certainly got out in the field at the grassroots level and, and shown that they want to have a voice, that they want to be heard.